I might get today's session started. So thanks everyone for joining us for the Choosing Wisely July webinar. My name is Anne-Marie Martin and I'm the Choosing Wisely Health Services Lead. I would like to begin today's session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're all dialing in from today. So I'm in Melbourne um, and we have the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to pay my re um, respect to the elders past, present and emerging as well. Please feel free to share the traditional owners of the lands um, that you're on today in the Q&A or the chat as well, if you would like. So thanks everyone for coming. And um, today we have three presenters. So we have William Timosimi and Caitlin Hardman who are from West Morton Health and Dr. Libby McCourt from Royal Ruby Women's Hospital. So I'll pass over to the three of you and there will be um, presentations presenting on the Opioid Wisely project. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. So today we're going to be presenting on Opioid Wisely and looking at the impact of policy interventions on oxycodone prescribing. Before I get started, um, we are at, in Ipswich Hospital in Queensland today, and I'd just like to pay my respects to the Agro Yugara and Yugara Paul people and acknowledge um, the elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so a little bit about us. My name is Caitlin Hardman. I'm the Senior Education and Training Pharmacist within West Morton Health and a Conjoint Associate Lecturer at uh, the University of Queensland School of Pharmacy. And I'm Will Timosimi and I'm the Drug Use Evaluation Pharmacist at Ipswich Hospital. And my name's Libby. I'm the Medication Use Review, Quality Improvement and Research Pharmacist at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. A bit about the session outline for today. We're going to talk about the current state of opioid prescribing and the complex interconnected nature of stewardship. We're also going to delve into looking at what our project found with respect to the impact of policy reform and prescribing limits on opioid prescribing. And then hopefully we're going to talk about some key messages for other Choosing Wisely Australia partners. Opioid use and its associated harms is an issue of great public health interest both within Australia and in internationally. The increase in opioid use is associated with parallel increases in opioid-related morbidity and mortality, including dependence and overdose. So, Callum, we've heard a lot about opioids in the news, in the literature, it kind of seems to be everywhere. It sort of seems like it's in vogue, for lack of a better word. But how big is this problem? Yeah, so it's in vogue for a reason. In 2016, pharmaceutical opioids were involved in more opioid deaths and opioid poisoning, poisoning hospitalisations than heroin. A report on national data and trends on opioid use and harms in Australia found that every day there were nearly 150 hospitalisations and 14 emergency department presentations involving opioid harm, with three drug-induced deaths involving opioid use. Wow, so that is a really big issue. And so are we talking about all opioids or are there anyone in particular that's a bigger concern? Oxycodone. So oxycodone was the most commonly dispensed prescription in 2016 to 17, with 5.7 million prescriptions dispensed to 1.3 million people. Australia now has the eighth highest prescribing rate per capita internationally, with 3 million people dispensed an opioid each year. Oh, wow. So we're dispensing a lot of opioids, but is, is this all overuse? Like, should we still be prescribing this medication or does it really have a place in therapy? Opioids play a central role in pain management in the acute hospital settings, especially after surgery and trauma. So in this case, so if we just use opioids, I guess, within hospital, would that sort of just solve our problem then? Well, there are some significant concerns regarding the appropriateness and the volume of opioid prescriptions on discharge in the hospital setting, and that opioids are often prescribed in excess of need. If we look at reducing the overprescription of opioids, it can have multiple harm, harm reduction benefits, including reducing the risk of long-term dependency and reducing opportunities for the diversion of unused tablets to non-medical use. Opioid stewardship programs provide pr pragmatic strategies to improve patient safety. Okay, so that's a good approach. So I guess what we should be doing is just aiming to use opioids appropriately within the hospital settings, and then that will solve our opioid problem. Is that right? 
Well, if only stewardship was that easy. So stewardship is a wicked problem and a wicked problem is often difficult or impossible to solve because of its complex and interconnected nature. There are many interdependent factors making them seem impossible to solve. Stewardship requires a deep understanding of the key stakeholders involved and an innovative approach provided by design thinking. Okay, so this is a really, really big problem then. So where do we start? How do you even begin to address this problem of this size? Taming a wicked problem is never going to be easy, easy, but a revealing characteristic of wicked problems is that the more you attempt a solution, the more it reveals itself to you. There are ways forward. The first is to shift the goal of action on significant problems from solution to intervention. Instead of seeking the just the right moves to eliminate a problem once and for all, we should recognise that any actions occur in an ongoing process in which further actions will be needed later on. One area that we focused on for this project was policy reform and intervention um, to curb prescribing practices for oxycodone 5 milligrams. So, Will, what was the catalyst for this project? So there were two key changes that served as the catalyst for this project. The first one was in August 2019, and that's when QMAC, and they're our statewide body within Queensland, which decides which medications are on that statewide formulary. So they, in this instance, what they did was they restricted the quantity of oxycodone 5 milligram tablets, which is prescribed and discharge to a maximum of 10 tablets. The second part of this catalyst was in June 2020, when the PBS reduced the pack size listing of oxycodone 5 milligrams to 10 tablets, which also led to a nudge in the IMR prescribing software. So what that basically means is that before this um, June 2020 intervention came into play, when the prescriber went to, I guess, write a prescription for, let's say, for example, endone 5 milligram tablets, it would come up with a default quantity of 20 in the system. Therefore, if the prescriber didn't make any changes to that quantity, the patient will walk out with a prescription for 20 tablets or a full box. After the June 2020 change, due to the change in the PBS, there was a, it led to a sort of a change within the system where the default then changed to 10 tablets. So what that means is if the doctor didn't make any further changes to the quantity when they'll prescribe or writing a prescription for endone tablets, the default quantity would be 10 tablets, and that's the amount that the patient would walk out the door with. Now, with all their changes, QMAC like to sort of review, um, review it and sort of see the impact on what their recommendations have had on prescribing practices. Now, in the old days, before we did have pre electronic prescribing within our hospital, this would have been a very long and tedious task because it would mean that we'd have to collect all opioid prescriptions um, of every prescription and we'd have to track them all down as well. However, since we are an electronic hospital, this was made much easier and we're able to download the data much quicker and effectively and do this project on a multi-site scale. And what did the project aim to achieve? Okay, so there were two key aims. So we wanted to evaluate the impact of sequential state and national policy interventions. So the two interventions that I referred to before. I mean, wanted to see how they, um, their what their impact was on the changes to the prescription of oxycodone prescriptions in Queensland hospitals. We wanted to look at a 27 month period. And that's because we wanted to look at nine months before the first intervention, which was the QMAC change. We then wanted to look at nine months after the QMAC change and before the PBS change, just to see what the difference was there with the first intervention. And then we wanted to look at the impact of both of those interventions. So we wanted to look at nine months after the PBS change. So Libby, how did we do this? Great question, Will. And as you mentioned, being um, an electronic hospital made this a lot easier. So after all the ethics and approvals were obtained, um, we were able to identify 12 electronic hospitals across Queensland that were going to participate in this study. Um, we were then able to run reports on discharge prescriptions for oxycodone 5 milligrams during the study period, which was December 2018 through to February 2021. Um, after a lot of data cleaning, which although the reports were easy to run we did need to clean the data a bit we did our analysis and that was how we did the project okay cool and then what did we find 
So we had a few exciting findings. Um, this is just a bit of a demographic breakdown of the prescriptions. As you can see over the period, we had over 110,000 prescriptions for oxycodone five milligrams across the 12 hospitals. Unsurprisingly, um, the biggest area where these medicines were prescribed was in surgical, making up about 50% of the oxycodone scripts. Next up, we had emergency, which was about 30%, and after that, medicine, which was about 13%. Okay, so this is a good summary of the overall data that we collected, but what happened with the interventions? How did it sort of change practice? Yeah, well, it was quite interesting to see. So this table breaks down the proportion of oxycodone five milligram discharge scripts written across the three periods. Um, what we're really focusing on here is the 10 tablets or less on this top row here. So we can see in the baseline period, we had about 60% of all prescriptions written for endone were for less than 10 tablets. That increased after those sort of local Queensland guidelines came into effect um, and bumped up to 73%. And after the PBS restrictions came into play, went up to about 90%. Okay, so one thing I've noticed is we sort of looked at um, proportion with these figures and their comparison. Why don't we look at proportion and not absolute numbers of prescriptions? Yeah, well, proportion was really important to use in this study for several reasons. Firstly, we wanted to see if there was a relative change in the number of tablets that were prescribed, um, and that's relative to the total number that was prescribed. We also were quite conscious that um, during the baseline and the QMAC restriction period, we had more hospitals becoming digital. So we, for example, maybe started with nine hospitals, and by the time the QMAC restrictions came in, we had 12. So that could potentially increase our numbers. We also had the nasty little COVID bug running around during that whole period, which could have impacted surgical um, and emergency department services. So we wanted to make sure that was taken into account as well. All right, fantastic. So if we're looking at this slide here, it's pretty overwhelming and a bit confusing to those of us who aren't, I guess, perfectly familiar with data and analysis. Could you just take us through this slide and explain what the red lines, the blue lines and the vertical lines are um, referring to? Sure can. So this is a really cool type of analysis called a segmented linear regression, which is usually used to sort of determine the impact of policy changes over time. So we see this used in a lot of different health services research. Um, the side of the graph represents the proportion of oxycodone scripts written for a quantity of less than 10 tablets. And across the bottom, we can see the sort of week of prescription. The red line is what we actually saw in our data. The blue line is what the modelled segmented linear regression shows us we would probably have. So we can see that those are sort of quite closely aligned. And these two lines, the first one here and the second one here, um, the first one is when the QMAC changes came into effect and the second one is when the PBS changes came into effect. So we can see in this baseline period, we sort of had um, trending anywhere between 50 and 60% of our scripts were for less than 10 tablets. Um, immediately after those QMAC changes, we had about a 10% increase, which is really interesting to see. Um, we also had quite a steep increase in the number of, um, of the proportion of scripts that were written for less than 10. And after our PBS changes, we saw another jump of around about 8% and then a plateauing out of that effect. All right. So just about that plateau at the end, why would the why wouldn't it continue to rise up to sort of that 100 percent mark? Why do you think that there was a plateau there? Yeah, so we need to investigate this a little bit further. But what we believe this 10 percent plateau it represents is those patients that actually needed more than 10 tablets. So maybe people that had more chronic pain, complex pain needs, maybe palliative care patients. Um, so we believe this is where patient centered care and prescribing of oxycodone has occurred, hopefully. Um, but as I said, we do sort of need to look into that further. Um, something that gives me a bit of confidence about this is that we recently did a point prevalence study at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, which is not a digital hospital, so it was quite time consuming. And we also saw this plateau at about 90%. So 90% of prescriptions were written for less than 10 tablets. All right, thanks, Libby. So, Caitlin, how does this project fit in with overall opioid stewardship? Yeah, well, when we're looking at stewardship, we can really leverage a lot on the learnings from the past decade from the antimicrobial stewardship program, which has involved um, an educational intervention, um, but also guidelines, implementation and adoption. 
With our particular study, we looked at the policy interventions and the effect that electronic hospital forced functions can have to assist with the prescribing um, nudges and, and curbing that prescribing uh, change, it, change for oxycodone five milligrams. Okay, and how can other sites look at adapting these findings from our study into their own stewardship model? Well, I think it highlights that stewardship is multifactorial. So um, there are elements with respect to engaging the key stakeholders, having those educational interventions, but also adopting and implementing policy reforms and also having those system-based approaches to prescribing practices for electronic hospitals to, to assist hos um, prescribers with that decision support um, for um, appropriate quantities on discharge. However, it, it does, as Libby did mention, there are certain um, pain conditions and cohorts of patients which do warrant um, an increase in um, quantity for their therapeutic conditions. So we are cognizant that there are some patient cohorts that do warrant increased quantities. Okay, so you've talked about sort of like the like electronic force functions that can help in, I guess, guide prescribing. But what about paper-based environments? Well, how about all the other hospitals that don't have electronic prescribing? What can they do? Yeah, well, as Libby did mention, um, she did repeat the study within Metro North and it, it potentially was quite an arduous process. Um, however, they did have those similar results um, to reducing quantity on discharge. So it, it can be done um, and it does impact um, by having those policy reforms, uh, irrespective of a paper-based or an electronic system for, for the hospital and health service. Okay, cool. I guess that makes sense. So do you have any other final words? Well, I just wanted to end that opioids are one of the priority substances in the National Drug Strategy for 2017 to 2026, which is a long-term framework for reducing and preventing harm. Hospital-initiated opioids, most often for acute pain management, have been identified as a key risk for ongoing and inappropriate use. And particularly for our Choosing Wisely Australia partners um, and hospital and health services, it's important to consider the multifactorial um, strategies that can be used for opioid stewardship. And, and our project has highlighted the impact of um, policy reform imp and implementation. Thanks very much. Thanks, Anne -Marie. everyone. Thank you for such a lovely interactive presentation. Um, so I'll just open the floor to questions. You can pop it in the Q&A if you have questions for our three presenters today. I've got a compliment there. So from Joe Cuthbertson, he's from WA, great presentation and project. Um, just while we're waiting for questions, do you know of any work or has your hospital done any work in the transitions of care space in relation to opioids? Yeah, well, this is a really good question, Anne-Marie, and, and probably very good time, time considering the, the launch of the National Clinical Care Standard for opioid stewardship and the quality statements that um, come with that National Clinical Care Standard. Uh, with our particular hospital, um, it's still a um, emerging space as to our, our position on that, but we have adopted opioid stewardship principles um, before the, the release of that national clinical care standard. But I think what hospital and health services will have moving forward is a more robust framework and approach um, to opioid stewardship particularly at those transitions of care, because that's where we're talking about um, minimising misuse, abuse and harm. But uh, in addition, um, the transparency of prescribing by having Q-script or real-time prescription monitoring, depending upon which state that you're in, um, will also have its benefits to curb prescribing practices. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, and we're quite lucky in Victoria. We've um, had safe script for a little while now, so we've definitely seen some benefits there. Um, so we have a question from Elizabeth Sue. So thanks for the interactive presentation. QMAC restriction, was this mandatory limit of 10 tablets um, of oxycodone 5 milligrams, or does it also allow for the prescriber's um, discretion? Yeah, so with the way that QMAC has their intervention, so it's a statewide 
I guess, committee. So one of the main recommendations they've rolled out on a statewide level. But at each local hospital, they have the capacity to have, I guess, what's, what we call individual patient approvals. So if it's deemed that a specific patient for whatever for whatever reason needs, I guess, a high quantity of oxycodone tablets, um, then that would be allowed. It's sort of it, the way that that's, that approval process happens is different at each different hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is, I guess, scope for them to prescribe above that 10 mil. Sorry, again, there is scope for them to prescribe above that 10, quantity 10 maximum if need be. And this is really important, especially for patients who are in palliative care and patients in oncology. So, yeah, that's a really good question. And there is scope for those patients to still get the pain medications that they need. And just on that, Will, I think that comes down to um, that patient-centeredness as well. So there, there is implications prescribing above the PBS. So there's financial implications for the patient if the appropriate approvals aren't received. But it, it is a nudge. It, it's there to help guide appropriate decision-making. Um, but it's not sort of um, to... Uh, disadvantage um, populations or um, patient-specific conditions that actually warrant increased quantities. All right, yes, yeah, so that makes sense. So I've got another couple of questions. Um, from Mary Swift, have you researched the experience of the people or patients who are part of the intervention, more particularly how they believe the change affected their medicine usage? And by the way, great presentation. Libby, do you want to answer this one from a further research angle perspective? Yeah, sure will. Um, So thanks for the comments, Mary. Um, We haven't researched this yet, but um, yeah, as you highlight, it would be really interesting to see that. And we're sort of acknowledging the limitations here that it was only um, discharge prescriptions from the hospital setting. We don't know if this intervention has inadvertently caused more strain on GPs because then patients go to GPs to get more scripts. Um, We also are unable to determine whether these prescriptions were actually filled. So it could be that um, we give out all these prescriptions and not many of them get filled at the community pharmacy or a certain proportion don't. So there are some big limitations to what we're presenting here. And it would be really great to sort of connect that across the areas of the care and um, see how this intervention has impacted um, community pharmacies and GPs and patients to see if they need to go to their um, doctor more regularly or even represent to emergency to get more um, pain medication. So that's definitely something that we're interested in doing in the future. Right. And is that, um, do you have plans to do that at this point in time with you or is it um, more thinking about it at this stage? Uh, I think it's more of a thinking about it at this stage. I'm not sure. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's definitely in the infancy. I suppose there's a lot of um, interconnecting factors when it comes to um, looking at connecting uh, those transitions of care from hospital to community to actual supply. But with the um, Victoria's in a, in a great position, having the real-time prescription monitoring, but I think when it comes to um, this type of research, we're probably looking at um, organisations that have a, a bigger breadth and access to data than what we do. Yeah, exactly. And also the um, absolute... Um, huge effort that was put into the ethics application just to get data from Queensland Health Hospitals um, was a lot. So I can't even imagine what it would be Mm. (laughs) across um, GPs and community pharmacies as well. But I'm sure Will's up to the challenge again. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, thanks, Mary, for your question. We have a question here from Sarah Din. um, She says, thank you for sharing your results. Was any data collected intentionally or not? about whether the patients being discharged with oxycodone used any inpatient doses of oxycodone in the 24 hours prior to being discharged. You want to go, Libby? Oh, yes, that's fine. Um, So because of the scope of the project, no, we didn't capture that. It was purely discharge prescriptions, um, but it would potentially be possible um, and mistake me if I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Will, to run um, a who was prescribed and received the oxycodone and who received it on discharge. And it would just probably require a bit of data linkage between those sets yeah, you're right, Libby. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good idea. 
um, that's definitely something that we could look at, especially since we already have this data collected um, and just look at cross referencing it. So that's definitely something that we can look at. Yeah, and that could even be expanded to simple analgesia as well to make sure people were prescribed or receiving those as well in the lead up to their discharge. All right, thanks, Sarah, for your question. Um, so I think that's all the questions, unless anybody has anything else to add. Um, I will just add that on the Choosing Wisely website, we have an opioids hub, um, and I'll add this presentation, link it in there. But we also have resources that can be used, um, so patient information leaflets when upon discharge, for example, um, and also other health services who have presented or have written up featured stories and opioids stewardship. So you can get ideas from, um, I guess, all the great work that's happening out there across all the different states as well. I don't think there are any other questions. Any last minute comments from Caitlin, William or Libby? Nothing from us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you to the three of you for such a great presentation. Um, next month, so we'll be having, I think, Caitlin and William back with us looking at an antipsychotics um, project and they'll be joined by one of their colleagues as well. So we look forward to that. And that will be the first Wednesday of the month as per usual at uh, three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So thanks everyone for joining. If you have any questions, feel free to email choosingwisely at nps.org.au. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next month. And thanks again for such a great presentation.